my far left is Mr. Gene Cash, represents the Blue Ridge District. Beside him is Mr. Scott Caldwell, representing the Valley District. To my right, Mr. Hunter Young represents the Amsterdam District, and Mr. Darren Hall represents the Pinkhouse District. On the right table, we have Mr. Watsburg from our, the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals Attorney. Uh, front row, we have Nicole Pendleton, Director of Community Development, Mr. Drew Pearson, Zoning Administrator, Mr. Mike Lockaby, County Attorney. Second row is Mr. Nick Baker, Code Enforcement, and Mr. John McCoy, Long Range Planner. To my left table is Ms. Laura Goh, the Secretary for the Board of Zoning Appeals, and I'm Stephen Kidd, Chairman. I represent the Buckhannon District. The full agenda of the package is posted on the Board of Zoning Appeals website for you and to follow along. If you go to the county web page, click on the Board of Zoning Appeals announcement on the left and click the link to the agenda. This will take you to the Board of Zoning Appeals webpage and the agenda in the documents. <coughs> to expedite business, the Board of Zoning Appeals has established the following rules and procedures. First, interruptions and outbursts will not be tolerated. After consideration of minutes, the board will hear arguments and evidence in item three and ask the county and the appellant to come forward and make their presentation. The zoning administrator, the county attorney, will speak first, then Rocky Forge. Next, the public will have an opportunity to speak, but no more than three minutes per person. Then the county and the appellant will each have a rebuttal. Public comments must pertain specifically to the appeal, with no other topic. Please direct all comments, questions to the board. Debate between a recognized speaker and an audience is not allowed. A closed session will take place after the public hearing, and recesses may be needed during the hearing for a break or a meal. When the public hearing is closed, the board of zoning appeals members will discuss this matter, possibly consult with their attorney, and, and announce a decision. So we're going to move forward into the review and approval of the September 14th meeting. Do I hear a motion? No. I move to approve the minutes for our meeting. Got a motion and a <coughs> second. Thank you for the discussion. <coughs> All those in favor? Yes. Or yes. 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 All those opposed? All right, we'll go right into item number three. We'll hear from the zoning administration first, either in three years or county attorney. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, I did want to check before I started talking. Am I under a time limit other than try to keep it as down as much as I can? You are not under a time limit at all. Well, okay. you, you, I'll start to the point would be appreciated. Yeah, I'll still try to keep you from getting bored. Uh, so, as uh, as you say, Mr. Chairman, my name is Michael Lockerbie. I'm the county attorney. I'm here uh, representing uh, Mr. Drew Pearson in his official capacity as the zoning administrator. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to dive right into this. I think that it's probably pretty clear uh, what the what the zoning administrator's decision is. I think that jumping into argumentation is probably the way to go for us. Uh, the reason there being that uh, it's a, I'm in the odd position of responding to an appeal before I hear what the appeal is but I think it's been presented in writing sufficiently that I can make that response. If you give me one second. <clears throat> Put here, 
text of the statute to try to understand better what the argument is about and color coded the different sections so that we can kind of see why it is that the zoning administrator read it, why he believes that this is the plain language meaning, why he believes his interpretation is the plain meaning language of the statute. Let's start off. Uh, the zoning administrator is presumed correct. The burden is squarely on the appellant to show why he's wrong. And uh, the BZA, you can affirm him, overturn him, or make some modification of his decision if you believe a modification is appropriate. So your role here, you can do pretty much whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> the first issue that we've seen arise, and it is an issue that the zoning administrator did um, address in his opinion, is whether or not he has the authority to make a determination at all with respect to this matter. And uh, I know that the appellants have raised that question as well. Uh, I point out, first off, the zoning ordinance says he can. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. If he has authority under the zoning ordinance to interpret issues arising under the zoning ordinance, that's a pretty strong argument for him having that authority. Um, secondly, he, he has to do so. Uh, in his daily life. He can't do his job without interpreting state code. Uh, at any event, he would have to interpret the uh, state code with respect to a site plan submitted pursuant to the SCD. He would have to make a determination as to whether the, uh, uh, this clause, this stuff right here, whether this whole section applies in any event, okay? Uh, he would, with respect to the exception clause versus the, uh, with, say the grandfather clause of um, the state statute versus the expiration clause of the SCP. He would have to make that determination at the site plan stage anyway. And in fact, he did make that determination with respect to a partial site plan submitted in late June. And on July 8th, he made the determination that this statute does not apply to a site plan. So at best, this issue is moot. He's already made it again in a different context that hasn't been appealed. Finally, if the zoning administrator couldn't make a determination, sometimes I feel it's important to turn around, uh, to turn around an argument and say, okay, what would it look like if this argument were true? Does that mean that if he's not sure whether this statute and the grandfathering clause and the expiration clause both apply, if he's not sure how they interact, does that mean that I have to go file a suit in circuit court in order to find out what the answer is? Or does that mean that he is the administrator of the statute gets to make a decision, uh, if he gets to make a decision as provided in the zoning ordinance? It would seem to be a deeply weird result if I were required to go file a debt suit in circuit court every time he wasn't sure how to interpret a, the way a state code applies to an application. All right, let's turn to uh, interpretation of the language. Since that really seems to be the core the interpretation of the language of the um, expiration clause as with and how the grandfathering clause applies for it. I want to make sure that I'm clear here. These poster boards, this first one just lays out what the overall section, 15.2.2209.1 colon 1, it lays out the language of the relevant part that we disagree about. We all agree that the orange and the orange go together. We are in disagreement about how the purple, pink, yellow, and green go together. We know that the green applies to something. We're just not sure up here what the green applies to, what it modifies. And I've been calling this the limiting condition. This says that for any special exception, special use permit, or conditional use permit, any modification outstanding as of July 1, 2020, and then you skip down, is extended until July 1, 2022. But this middle part, it defines, it presents a limiting condition, and it pr provides what it is that is extended. And this is what we're really talking about today, and I'm going to try to show you why it is that the zoning administrator's interpretation is the plain interpretation. Now let's start off with a few different principles to kind of put you in the right mindset for reading this. A party seeking to qualify for the application of a grandfather clause has the burden of proving that they qualify for it. So it's always upon the person who's trying to qualify to be grandfathered to show, to show that they uh, qualify for the rule. In Virginia, administrative officials and tribunals like yourselves are required to follow the plain meaning of the law, reading it like a normal person. 
If the statute's plain, then you don't use rules of interpretation. You just read it. Uh, we call those special rules rules of statutory construction. I suspect you're going to hear a lot about them from the appellant. I'm not going to resort to them much because I think the plain language is sufficient for you to understand this statute. In any event, the first and foremost principle that you're ever going to have is that you need to look, interpret a statute in light of its manifest purpose. The issue as to punctuation, I know that the appellant is going to talk to you, I believe, a lot about punctuation. Uh, the Supreme Court of Virginia has explained that punctuation is said to be the most fallible of all standards by which to interpret a statute. And that punctuation should not be resorted to unless all other ways of reading the statute have failed. In other words, a comma is just too small of a hook to hang this much weight on. You need to look at the entire language of the statute in context. So let's first look at what the purpose of this statute was. Uh, when this statute was adopted in October 2020, we were seven months into the COVID-19 pandemic. We knew roughly what the re what, how it was impacting the economy at that point. The General Assembly was trying to address what was actually impacted. Now the planning department, and you see this in the evidence, they didn't see any drop off in site plan permitting. Lots of, permit, lots of site plans were still submitted during that time period. Just no month to month drop off during COVID. The county also has tens of thousands of dollars in engineering um, and surveying work contracted out at any given moment. We didn't see any delays. Our engineers and surveyors did not report any delays at all. In fact, some of them worked faster because they found that they were more effective working at home than working in their office. Um, I, I would ask, I know Mr. Young and Mr. Caldwell, you two are engineers. Did you and your colleagues see any particular drop off in your work? Did you find your productivity dropped off? Did your friends and colleagues find any drop off? I'm willing to bet that they didn't. Engineering simply was not particularly affected by the COVID. Construction was. Actually starting a project, actually doing something, that, yeah, that was definitely impacted. We found as a county that we had all sorts of construction delays. And uh, of course, Mr. Pearson would, would testify to that. That was all over the place due to supply chain disruptions, due to Dolby regulations about how people needed to work together in construction. But we did not find engineering to be the least bit delayed or have the least bit of a problem. And in any event, uh, Rocky Forge had until 2025 to even start thinking seriously about construction. So that just really wasn't the issue, either that Rocky Forge had or that the General Assembly was trying to address in October of 2020. Now let's look at the basic structure of the statute. As I said, the orange blocks go together. We don't know how the green, or we're arguing about how the green applies to the yellow, the pink, and the purple. The first issue that I want to address is whether the expiration clause is even a deadline. <coughs> expiration and a deadline are different things. The deadline typically means there's some kind of a penalty involved. An expiration of an SCP does not imply that there's any sort of notice of violation, I'm not going to take anybody to general district court over that. It's an expiration. Does anybody say that when their milk expires or their loaf of bread expires, you call it a deadline? No. You say it's going bad. You say it's going stale. You might say it's gone by. But you don't call it a deadline. You don't go to your wife and say, well, gosh, we need to finish that milk because we have a deadline. That's not what we think of. And it's not as though the sheriff's going to come to your house and yell at you for letting your milk go by. There's absolutely no reason why there's a deadline here at all. There's not a deadline. There's not a requirement. You can do it or you can not do it. Lots of people let their SCPs lapse without doing anything. And there's no penalty other than if you ever get serious about it again, you've got to come back to the Board of Supervisors and ask. It's not really a deadline. Well, let's talk about how these actually go together. The first answer is the answer that the zoning administrator adopted. The zoning administrator adopted the view that this green reaches up to the deadline. So it's a deadline that requires the landowner or developer to commence the project or incur significant expenses related to improvements 
to of the project within a certain time is extended. Where would you find that deadline? You have the modification right here. A deadline in the exception permit or in the local zoning ordinance. We believe that that's the common sense reading of this. And there's a couple of reasons for that, but the main reason is that if you look at it the way that the appellant is looking at it, the, the statute stops making sense. And I'll show you why that's the case. The appellant is saying that this green only attaches to this yellow. It doesn't attach to the pink or the purple. But this creates a couple of issues. The first of which is it creates an ungrammatical sentence. So if you have separate clauses, you need to read that. That means they're independent. They could be read separately without respect to one another. So for any valid special exception, special use permit, or conditional use permit, or a modification thereto, outstanding as of July 1, 2020, you should be able to say any deadline in the exception permit is extended until July 1, 2022. And that works. It does work. Or you could say, outstanding as of July 1, 2020, in the, in, or in the local zoning ordinance that requires all these things is extended until July 1, 2020. But that stops making sense because we're not talking about the zoning ordinance up here. That doesn't make any sense for you to be talking about a deadline just in the zoning ordinance because you're talking about special exceptions, SUPs, and CUPs. There's no connection between the two things. You wind up with a sentence that's of questionable grammatical uh, quality. You also wind up with a sentence that doesn't mean anything. The second issue is if any deadline in the special exception it is always extended. You result in, this results in a major dichotomy that's not rational between how you treat a requirement in the zoning ordinance and a requirement in SCP. And I'll illustrate this. Let's say that you had exactly the same language in an SCP as you had in the zoning ordinance. Um, you had language in 25446 of the zoning ordinance, you had exactly the same language in an SCP. And let's say that that particular language allowed a, uh, a, a person to extend an SCP by one year if they just sent a letter to the Board of Supervisors extending it. We actually used to have a provision in the zoning ordinance that allowed people to do that, I believe, one time. I think that was years ago, we did away with it. But we used to have that. And we sometimes still have that show up in SCPs. It's very rare. I think we've seen it more in proffers. But it happens. That letter would have absolutely nothing to do with requiring the landowner to commence the project or incur significant expenses and improvements. So in a zoning ordinance context, if it was in 25446, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be extended at all. Okay. If it were in the special exception permit, they wouldn't then have to send the letter until July 1, 2022. That's a deeply weird result to have a, the same requirement be treated very different ways depending on whether it's an exception in the special exception versus in the zoning ordinance. It's just not a rational way to think that the General Assembly was thinking about this. Now I want to turn to the issue of what does this green language mean? Okay. Requiring a landowner or developer to commence the project or incur significant expenses related to improvements of the project within a certain time. Again, if you think the expiration date on a loaf of bread is a requirement, please, by all means, go for it. But I don't think that that is a common or standard way of talking that a, uh, that a, deadline, that is, that a deadline or a requirement is the same as expiration. There's no requirement there. I would secondly point out that the zoning ordinance says that in order to commence a use, you need to file a site plan first. You need to have an approved site plan. The second issue is that in order to commence any work with respect to the Rocky Forge uh, turbines, this is in 25446 of the ordinance and in the SCP, you needed to file a construction plan. Neither of those things have happened. If, in fact, Rocky Forge has commenced the project, Rocky Forge really needs to have a serious discussion about the NOV the zoning administrator is going to write them. 
Secondly, let's talk about an improvement. Incur significant expenses related to improvements. Let's talk about significant expenses. Rocky Ford says that they expended $4 million on doing a site plan with respect to a $100 to $120 million project as reported in the media. $4 million is a lot of money to me, but I play in hundreds of thousands of dollars in my business. If you're playing in a business where you have hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, it's a drop in the bucket. I would also question how it is that Timmons Group managed to run up $4 million in bills on the site plan that we got, but that's a whole different question. Um, the other thing is that it has to be related to improvements. An improvement is not an improvement to a site plan application. They have only improved an application for a permit. They have not improved property. Improvement implies, and there are cases about this, which of course I, I might wind up having to bring up in circuit court, but there are cases about this where they talk about improvements are something that is a discernible work on the ground. Something like site work, something like building something, something like pouring footers. It is not improving a permit so that maybe you can someday do that if you decide you want to in the future. That is not an improvement. That's an improvement to a permit, application, it's not an improvement to property. And our contention is that this term refers specifically to improvements with respect to property. That really, uh, I believe, um, explains where the zoning administrator is. It explains, I think, what our generalized response would be to uh, the appeal. I'm willing to answer any questions you have or sit down and hear what Mr. Lawton's about to say. Thank you. Sir. Any questions for you? So I guess we'll hear, we'll hear from the other side. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. May I turn? Commonwealth uh, for the power purchase uh, 
of the energy that's going to be produced by these turbines. In October of 2019, uh, my client submitted an application for amendments. Uh, and in the intervening time from October 2019 until May of 2020, when that was approved, um, COVID hit. Um, and as we all know, in March of 2020, Governor Northern issued his executive order declaring a state of emergency. Uh, and COVID had real impacts on this project. Um, as we made clear in our briefing, uh, COVID uh, from, from the spring of 2020 up through October, COVID um, significantly um, affected the ability of engineers and others to be able to travel here to do reviews and examinations of things that were necessary for the site plan. And that did delay um, the submission of the site plan. Because the first site plan that was submitted uh, was not submitted until December of 2020. So COVID caused real delays. Um, in May of 2020, uh, the Board of Supervisors um, uh, approved Rocky Forge's applications that were submitted back in October of 2019. Um, now the, the project would have 22 turbines that were up to 680 feet tall. And at this point, um, based on developments in turbine technology, it's, it's likely that the number of turbines will only be 13 when the project is finally built. But the focus um, here is on condition 18 in the special exception permit, which I know you're all familiar with. Um, <coughs> They gave Rocky Forge 12 months um, to get a site plan approved. Now, whether you want to call that a deadline or an expiration date, um, that is, uh, as a lawyer, um, I recognize good lawyerly uh, semantics, and I think that's a distinction without a difference. Um, I think it's the same thing. In October of 2020, uh, two things happened. First, DEQ approved Rocky Forge's permit modification, and then second, Governor Northern signed into law the legislation um, that was proposed uh, in the Senate initially, uh, passed the Senate and the House, so we all still will speak to that in a moment. Um, and that's the, the legislation that I want to focus on um, in my arguments. But it's very clear, and I'll just call it 2209, um, 15.2, 2209.1, uh, we're talking about subsection B. Um, I've given you a handout. Um, the first page is the entire subsection. The second page is subsection B, um, and it's color coded. Um, and this is the color coding that we use in our notice for appeal. Uh, slightly different from the counties. Um, and, and I think the color coding it kind of illustrates the, the different ways we're viewing the statute. Because I think there are two buckets that the General Assembly created. Um, in terms of what they were trying to do in recognition of how COVID was affecting Virginia's economy all throughout the state. Not just, and this isn't, you know, this isn't just a Bobby County issue. This is an issue here in Norfolk, up in Fairfax, and, and down in Southwest, further down in Southwest Virginia. So the General Assembly recognized that COVID was affecting different localities in different ways. And so what it did is it, it made two buckets of extensions. And I think if you look at the statute, it's very clear. Um, the first bucket is for any valid special exception, special use permit, or conditional use permit, for any modification <coughs> there to outstanding as of July 1st, 2020. So the, the special exception permit at issue here <coughs> falls, qualifies for that. There's, <coughs> excuse me, There's no dispute that the, the permit that we're talking about falls into this first bucket. It was outstanding as of July 1st, 2020. Any deadline in that exception permit, if you look in red, is extended until July 1st, 2022, or such longer period as may agree, as we agreed to by the locality. That is what that, that is what applies here. And it's, it's a very straightforward rule of construction. I do agree with Mr. Lockerbie. Um, and well, I agree with him on the rule of construction. I disagree with him that I'm gonna give you all these rules um, about how, how to interpret this statute. Because the Supreme Court of Virginia has made very clear, if a statute is, is um, clear and unambiguous, you use a plain meaning. That's it, that's the rule. You look at it, you see what the General Assembly did, 
Um, and the comments here are important, because what the General Assembly did is there's one bucket for special exception permits or other types of permits. There's another bucket for local zoning ordinance issues. And so that, that doesn't apply here, because it has, as you know from the, the Vodafone zoning ordinance, construction can't begin until the site plan is approved. So no construction has begun. The second part of 2209B does not apply here. That we are only in the first part. And the first part clearly applies because this is a special exception permit that was outstanding as of July 1st, 2020. And because of that, what the General Assembly said is anything that was outstanding as of July 1st, 2020 is automatically extended until July 1st, 2022. Or such other time as as a locality may, may consent to. So Rocky Forge could come in and say, actually, we need a little longer. Um, somebody building a project um, in Richmond could come in and say, actually, we need to go until December of 2022. And the locality has that freedom to get that extension. And the General Assembly recognizing the, the difficulties of COVID and how it was impacting um, localities gave localities that ability um, to recognize what was going on in their, in their neighborhoods um, and, and give extensions as they saw fit. Um, a couple of other things real quickly, just in terms of responding to the record. Um, well, do you have any questions on the statutory interpretation issue? I think it's very straightforward. Um, you know, and I think we clearly there are two buckets that apply. There's there's a permit bucket and there's a zoning ordinance bucket that the General Assembly did um, in subsection B. And we clearly um, the permit bucket clearly applies here. And that's how I think the zoning administrator um, aired um, is he, he did not parse out the statute in the correct way. And in terms of his authority. Um, and I do want to touch on that very quickly. The standard of review of the zoning administrator's um, decision is it's presumed correct, and my burden is preponderance. And I think that illustrates why the zoning administrator did not have the authority to make a legal interpretation like he did here. Uh, because if, if it was a, uh, if the General Assembly would have recognized if he had the authority to interpret uh, state statutes, not a local zoning ordinance, but state statutes, the standard of review would have been de novo, because that's the, that's the standard of review the Supreme Court of Virginia has recognized for legal issues. And because that is not the standard in the Code of Virginia in 2286, it illustrates why the zoning administrator did not have the authority to interpret subsection D of 2209. Unless the board has any questions, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Delegate Austin come up and speak for a moment. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the DZA. It, it's a uh, reflection in time when I think back 28 years ago when I sat in the seat you're sitting today. And uh, I owe a debt of gratitude to Mr. Cash. Mr. Cash was on this board when I was there, so and I thank all of you for your service. Mr. Cash, in particular, I thank you for your dedication. Bob Dot Canada. It's quite admirable. Uh, as you know, I have uh, been a proponent and supported Rocky Ford Wind from the very beginning. I was uh, on board of supervisors when we entered first entertained that type 
hours to measure wind sources. I uh, recognize and believe in alternative energy. I think we have to posture ourselves in the Commonwealth to uh, not only have fossil fuel energy, but to have alternative sources of energy. And uh, being the first inbound wind project in Virginia, I felt this was an opportunity for Bottletop County to engage when we did early on. And uh, it, it's been a bumpy road. But uh, I would say this project with any new concept has taken many years to come to fruition. The advancement of technology has allowed wind turbines while producing the same net energy to reduce wind turbines while reducing the same net energy. Also delaying the project was a recession and a need for a purchaser of the power. Ultimately, the governor negotiated the purchase of the power as a source for the Commonwealth of Virginia, which I was quite proud of. I really appreciate the governor engaging himself because he also recognized the need for diversity in our power grid in Virginia. During the process, we have, we have been influenced by the effects of COVID. Not only has this project been delayed, so too have our daily lives. Many of us have lost friends and family members. Our world has been disrupted. And in my opinion, we are far from normal. Many elements of our daily lives are still being affected. Supply and demand of the product and availability of workforce still in short supply. As a reaction to the impacts, Senator Lewis introduced SB 5106, local land use approvals to address the COVID-19 pandemic. The bill was introduced in the Committee of Local Government. The Senate voted 10 to 1 in support. The bill passed the Senate by a vote of 32 to 4. On the House side, the bill was introduced into general laws. There, the vote was 21 to 0 in support. The bill passed the House by a vote of 91 to 5 with one abstention. I fully supported and understand the intent of the legislation and voted in favor. After hearing that the county administrator, the county administration, felt this project was not encompassed in the intent of the adopted legislation, I felt compelled to ask the patron, Senator Lewis, to share his intentions of the legislation. What I provided for you is a copy of a letter from Senator Lewis the legislation as adopted and the vote tally in both the Senate and the House across the Senate floor and the House floor. So now you understand and see who voted in favor, who against, and, and the vote count associated with the legislation. Mr. Chairman, I have with me a letter drafted that I provided to you all um, from Senator Lewis. So at this time, Mr. Chairman, the letter is addressed to you if you so desire to read it or if you choose to have me read it. <coughs> Be better coming from you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The letter headed to Senate of Virginia. The letter is addressed to Mr. Steve Kidd, Chairman, Ottawa County Board of Zoning Appeals, 57 South, Sutter Drive, Delville, Virginia. Mr. K Chairman Kidd and members of the Board of Zoning Appeals, I'm writing today to add context to the legislative intent of Senate Bill 5106 legislation I carried in 2020 and that is now established in the Virginia State Code 15.2.220911. With the emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, it became clear that many developers and project applications were having difficulties meeting statutory deadlines for other expiration dates, such as complying with valid periods and commencing projects within a certain time frame. This was due to many reasons, ranging from public health concerns and economic uncertainties to delays, closures, and staffing issues in localities around the Commonwealth. Senate Bill 5106 was drafted as a temporary stopgap measure to give the development community additional time to evaluate the market and get their projects moving again before they lose their permitting rights which would require any significant investment of time and resources on top of what they have already invested to be granted the initial approval. This legislation was also crafted to help local governments preserve much needed economic development projects, eliminate the need to undertake time case-by-case -case extensions, and allow for some predictability for the economic development community in a time of great uncertainty. While drafted and passed this legislation, we drafted and passed this legislation with the intent that it would provide statutory relief to all projects 
affected by the current pandemic and intended for it to cover all current development projects. If the chair or the board has additional questions regarding the legislation or subsequent code sections, please reach out to my office at District 6 at senate.virginia.gov. Sincerely, Linwood W. Lewis, Senator, 6th District of Virginia, copy Delegate Terry Austin, 19th House District of Virginia. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, I was quite disappointed to understand that Bob Todd felt that this legislation did not apply. Uh, the General Assembly uh, takes great uh, uh, importance and significance in any legislation we have drafted and adopt. We have ample time and opportunity to put amendments on any bill, in any committee, either on the Senate side or on the House side. So there were no amendments. There was one amendment that pertained to housing only. Uh, other than that, there were no amendments on this legislation. I personally felt the legislation was all inclusive, as I've stated in the paper. I still feel the legislation is all inclusive. I think had we intended for exceptions to be granted, we would have put those exceptions in the legislation. So I thank you for your time. Do you have any questions for me at this time? Thank you so kind. Thank you. Yes, sir. No, sir, I did not. Apex has had more opportunities in time than any other industry to get it together. 
yet they still claim their time delays are not their fault. Their own project manager stood in front of the supervisors in the middle of the pandemic and was asked by supervisors if there was delays. Mr. Johnson said everything was on track. It is outrageous that Apex is claiming COVID delays only after submitting plans that were not denied many obvious errors and omissions. This company has a reputation in states of getting their way because they claim green energy. In fact, Rocky Forge is green washing. Their claims for good for the environment don't add up on top of a mountain and a wildlife corridor. The Huntley Farm Trust is a very large tract of land and water and conservation needs an easement sitting directly below where turbines will be. If this is allowed to continue until my family home, log cabin, hay, fields, wildlife plots be washed away from permanent removal of trees, blasting of this mountain for massive foundation. Creek flooding has been worse since the loss of the ash trees, and Apex has provided no data about this or any of the concerns my family has. Our own governor recently stood not far from the RF site in Green Acre State Parks and said Virginia's top three industries were agriculture is number one. Rocky Forge and slaughter of bats, but which are crucial to our, our tourism, is number two. Rocky Forge will harm tourism in this area because people, because of our beautiful landscapes, not industrial construction, our beautiful landscapes, not our industrial construction. Forestry, RF will be the start of removing trees on top of our mountaintops. <coughs> it's time to send a pet packing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Chef Coffee. 
Danny Coffey, Salisbury Road in Rock, Virginia. I wish I had written out a great speech for you like the rest of these two days. I figured I'd just tell you what I know right off the stump here. I've worked in windmill industry for the last 15 years. I work for a crane company, which is we have an interest, and have been, I'm one of the first people to contact Apex about obtaining some work for the people I work with and the man I work for, who has been very good to me and almost 300 employees. Um, I do not believe it is right for anyone to tell Mr. Fraley what he should do with his property. In 19, about 1980, when I worked for the county here, a man named Burke, who was a judge in Mecklenburg County, wanted to build a hydroelectric dam one mile below my property in Able Rock. Every time I would turn the corner in Pencastle, somebody was handing me a clipboard a sign. We don't want anybody to build a hydroelectric dam down there. It will ruin the, the river. And my first question was, have you ever been there? And I always got the same answer, no. Then how do you know it will ruin it? And get back water on my land, make my land worth more money. There will be access made for canoes and boats. They killed us. I got home the other day, the whole mess of people on my front porch who come down the river, got lost, and then when they were gone, I had to haul them out of there. I'm being invaded by people, boats, cars, <coughs> I don't think anybody should be able to tell me what to do with my property. I don't think they'll be trampling all over it, but it happens. Things change. I've been involved in county most of my life from the Sheriff's Department on. Things change. I hate that the people, some people here don't like the windmill. I work there. They're clean. The roads are kept up. There are five rentals to check. I've seen more game on those trails, back in those mountains. I've been six to seven miles back in Mountain West Virginia, Pennsylvania. 50, 60 deer, coons in the daytime, foxes, <coughs> birds, everything. It's clean, they're environmentally safe. Talking about cutting trees, I went to Illinois, bought that mountain years ago. I didn't like that. Judge Thompson's father sold his land. I didn't like that. It's not mine. Nobody should be able to tell me what to do with my land. That's just my opinion. And nobody should be able to tell Mr. Friendly what to do with his land. If he wants to lease an apex, he should be allowed to. I talked to people at Mount Storm, people on the land, and they're happy with it. There's always mixed feelings about it. any change. We need something in this county so that the burden of tax is totally on the people. We don't need a bedroom community for run out. We need something here to keep the people of Botica from being taxed together. Clifton Board is dying. Clifton only has a paper mill. Did you did you ever use that at other times? Sure. Eagle Rock is dying. But Canada's off Grondike and the I forget the name of the plant. They're stripping it, taking it away. Let's get something to bring some money into the county to help everybody. It's not about special interests and special people. This do something for everybody. Be open women. Thank you. Stephen News. Yes. I do the pen read your right, I'm sorry. It's because I'm an engineer. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Steve Neese. I live at 750 Morris Creek Road in Lexington, approximately three miles from the Rocky Ford Project. I'm an engineer that works for a geotechnical firm. I've read the letter from Mr. Robert Lufton with Inquirer Woods dated July 22, 2021, addressed to Drew Pearson. 
The purpose of the letter was to ask Mr. Pearson to reconsider his decision on July 7th. One of the reasons given for APEX's inability to meet the SCP deadline was, and I quote, in particular, COVID restrictions prevented engineering personnel from conducting field work necessary to prepare pricing and engage with the process of the project as necessary to complete the site plan. Geotechnical information that requires field sampling of soils could not be prepared or was significantly delayed due to COVID. I challenge that assertion. During 2020, my firm performed 7,252 geotechnical explorations in our 60 offices. Many of those were for renewable energy projects. We performed 420 geotechnical explorations from our Roanoke, Charlottesville, and Richmond offices alone. We did not miss a lick because of COVID. There were no restrictions placed on typical two to three man drill crews that, require, that were required to perform the field work. Laboratories remained in operation and engineers wrote the reports from home. I know, no, I know other engineering con companies continued in the same fashion. The idea that APEX was delayed because they could not engage an engineer to perform geotechnical projects does not hold the word in my opinion. I want to thank Bottop County Board of Supervisors for keeping an open mind on this project. I especially thank Mr. Pearson for his accurate determination on the SCP and holding firm the conditions the BOS placed on the SCP. Thank you. Thank you. Water. 
Um, and I'd like first to note that the streams and the water on Mr. Fraley's property do not belong to him. They flow downstream. Uh, they fill people's wells and well waters. Um, and um, they belong to actually all of us, just like the air. In Bonneton County, I and two other members of Virginia's for Responsible Energy monitor three native trout streams. One, Mill Creek, flows under a small bridge that Apex needed to shore up so that it could support heavy equipment hauling large turbine sections. We also monitor two other bottom-top creeks, Sinking and Rocky. The latter begins at springs up on North Mountain near the Rocky Fork project site. It's, <coughs> sorry. it's pretty basic, the elements that make for healthy trout streams. If you cut trees in riparian buffers, streams heat up, fish die. It's that simple. When habitat is destroyed and temperatures rise, trout congregate at the mouth of these cool water tributaries or springs, like those that feed the two streams that we monitor at locations that are downstream from Rocky Forge on land adjacent to the project site. Blasting, erosion, and sedimentation above these springs in karst topography alters both water surface waters and pockets of groundwater, especially when you build steep access roads through wetlands adjacent to streams, displaced water and stormwater must be artificially channeled. How do you artificially channel stormwater? Um, you meet the requirements of a site plan that specifies how you're going to do this because our water is very valuable. So site plan approval means that the locality, Bata County, ensures that the effects of construction on natural resources like water and fish are minimized. Quite the opposite happened in Apex's case. In her letter uh, with 102 site, deficiency, site plan deficiencies, Nicole Pendleton um, mentioned many uh, of the individual and specific issues um, with the site plan having to do with water. Um, one was Apex failed to include floodplain uh, elevation data on bridge construction data and bridge construction data. It's clear that the county site plan's installation failed to pass muster. In adhering to the conditions set forth in the SEP, county administrators have safeguarded the integrity of the SEP process and water resources in, in uh, Bogota and has set a standard of fairness for other businesses. Um, sorry to overrun. And I have a copy to give to you that would help you for your next Jim Crowley. Paul 
called Paul Meyer, Jesse James Meyer's cowboy test it all through the 19th century. Oh, uh, I come across an uh, article in the run of paper on September the 12th that points out the natural marine resources that would have to be used to build one wind turbine. It is 335 tons of steel, 4.7 tons of copper, 3 tons of aluminum, and more than 700 pounds of rare earth minerals, whatever they are. Now, uh, that's a lot of natural re resources, and you multiply that by 22, and plus these things on machines, they'll have to be repaired and kept up and, and uh, maybe e even replaced over time. And that's going to eat, eat, eat up a lot of more natural resources. And the author of this article was a Jessica Tobi, T-O-Y-B-E. Why? That works on education and energy policy for inside sources, whoever they are. Well, in the title of this article is You Can't Go Green Without Mining. So I say this woman is talking about we need to surface mine Virginia Mountains to have green energy which is hard on trees because it destroys the soil which a tree is nourished by. And, uh, and uh, trees help make the oxygen we breathe. But if a dollar was involved, a tree don't have much of a chance in this county. And uh, so uh, all I can say, it seems like Miss Jessica is trying to say to have green energy, the green and green energy is just going to have to suffer, which I think is sad and short-sighted. But if a penny was money, we all be rich. You all have a good day. Thank you.
ask you to take a positive step forward and show the rest of Virginia what a rural county in Southwest Virginia can do. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Blanche. Scott, Lexington, Virginia. First, I'm uh, associated with the group Virginians for Responsible Energy, and I'd like to say that we are not opposed to renewable energy. We're simply opposed to poorly cited renewable energy. 
to be uh, chairman of the and members of the board. In 2020, Bonapak County and Apex entered into our contract called the Special Exception Permit that would expire on May 26th of this year if Apex did not get the site plan approved. For whatever reasons, Apex failed to meet that requirement, thus the contract has expired, and that should mean that Rocky Forge will not be built. But we are here today because Apex chose to challenge the ruling by Mr. Pearson that the contract <coughs> had expired. Apex's challenge is based on their interpretation of the COVID statute, or I'll just refer to it that way, and so all the numbers in it. That statute provides extensions to special exception contracts meeting certain conditions. These conditions do not apply to Apex's special exception permit, as clearly stated in Mr. Pearson's letter. But even if the conditions in the COVID statute did apply to the contract that SCP had, the, challenge, the statute itself would be challenged. Remember, the entire reason we are here is that Apex failed to meet its contractual obligations. The contract clause in the Virginia Constitution, Article 1, Section 11, provides the General Assembly shall not pass any law impairing the obligation of contract. But that is exactly what Apex is arguing the COVID statute does. The county and Apex had agreed on the terms of the contract in May of 2020, and Apex never made any request to the county to change the conditions or extend the expiration date. Thus, Apex had an obligation to provide a site plan approved by the county in order to extend the contract, and Apex failed to do this. As a result, if Apex were to prevail today, the county would be determining that the COVID statute allows the county to retroactively change the conditions of an existing contract. This is called an ex post facto law, and it is what is prohibited by the Virginia Constitution. In 1989, the Virginia Supreme Court ruled in favor of Hugh Blaine Incorporated versus the Virginia Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control. Hugh and Charlie challenged the change to the Virginia Line Franchise Act that had an ex post facto impact on the contracts with some wholesalers. The court found that since the act had a retroactive effect and was an improper exercise of police power, that is, the power to regulate behavior and enforce order for health, safety, morals, and general welfare, the act was unconstitutional. Thus, the claim by Apex that they are saved by the COVID statute is meaningless. Since the COVID statute is unconstitutional, and regardless of any other arguments that it made, the SEP is expired. So what other challenges will they make? Who knows? Did, we know that the county will, will have to pay for it. So I thank you, uh, Mr. Pearson, for his ruling, and respectfully ask the board to offer that. Thank you. Thank you.
Teresa Hansen. <coughs> Jim Crawford. Jim had to run off. Okay. Dave Condon. Connection to COVID delay. 
I urge you to vote upholding the zoning administration's decision that the site's plan is expired. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Matt Cooper.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Bentley. I live in Salem, Virginia. I'm the secretary of the Rona Group Sierra Club, representing 800 members, and our group includes Bogdot County. So I feel like that gives me some standing to speak. Virginia has 20,000 Sierra Club members, and our chapter does uh, support Rocky Forge as, as our local group, and we have from the very beginning. Uh, myself and our executive committee uh, toured the site for the uh, project uh, on Jerry Fraylin's property at, at a very early part uh, about four years ago, and we've been a supporter, strong supporter ever since. Um, I wanted to remind you, even though it hasn't been men mentioned yet, that we're having a major international conference on climate change uh, sponsored by the United Nations is coming up. It's COP26. And the scientists there, just a few weeks ago, issued a code warning for humanity about the climate emergency, which should be taken account into your decision. We need to rapidly reduce the use of fossil fuels and move to clean energy. And wind energy is among the cleanest of energies. And uh, despite the use of materials that are incurred in building the windmills, they last long enough, the parts are recyclable, and these windmills will all be made in the United States. So they will not require large transportation costs from foreign countries. I believe the Senate Bill 5106 clearly states that uh, this Rocky Forge project should have had an extension that was denied earlier. And that should be rescinded in our view and allow this project to go forward. We also believe that this project will be a boon to the tourist industry in Vidata County because this is the very first wind farm in the state of Virginia. We are way far behind North Carolina, West Virginia, Maryland, all the surrounding states. Even Texas, a big fossil fuel state, is big on wind energy, as are many Republican states. So we've got to move forward in Virginia. This is our first opportunity to really get going and be the first in the state. And I believe people will come from far and near to see this project when it's projected to be finished. And it will be beautiful. The, I have gone through wind farms in Illinois, and they are gorgeous to watch. This is a $10 million investment already paid up and should not be lost by the calendar in the state of Virginia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Team Mudge. Actually, it's Tenny Mudge, but I respond to absolutely anything, so thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman Kidd and members of the board. I support each of you to stand by the caliber of competence and expertise already applied to the conclusion of law that has been accurately determined by Mr. Pearson's full authority. I have been attending, speaking at, and following the issues of Rocky Forge diligently for over five years. It is an honor to be affiliated with the engineers, professors, business owners, veterans, farmers, and concerned citizens of Virginians for Responsible Energy. The negative impacts of this poorly cited project have been well documented, and it's a project that isn't green to begin with, and poses great liability to Botata County. This is not a matter of if one is for or against the project. This is a matter that Apex, by their self-serving motives and disregard for the truth, cannot change the conclusion of law. Apex has no one to blame but themselves for their failure to advance their site plan application and comply with Condition 18 of the SCP. From the beginning, the SCP clearly states what is required for a complete site plan. 
The county found over 100 errors even in the third submission by Apex. Of all the recorded meeting minutes of the Board of Supervisors during the pandemic, at no time did Apex make mention that the project delays were occurring due to COVID. Not once. In fact, on February 23, 2021, Charlie Johnson of Apex stated to the Board that they are on track to issue a notice to proceed. There are no improvements that have begun on this project. At no time has Botata County issued any approval or permits for land clearing or the harvesting of trees. No site plan has been approved, no building permit has been issued. The statute has no effect upon Condition 18 of the SEP. As accurately already determined, the SEP has expired. Apex and its reputation of serving its own interests fails to change what is the conclusion of law. I urge you today to stand by Mr. Pearson's professional authority, expertise, and thorough determination. I thank you sincerely. Thank you. <coughs> Jan, excuse me, Jan Crawford. Good morning, Chairman, VZA. I'm Dan Crawford of 2311 Kipling Street Southwest, Toronto. I'm chair of the Sierra Club Rona Group. Now, their Bottershop is one of the eight counties that make up the Rona Group. Apex Clean Energy is a perfect example of the intent of the Commonwealth's COVID-19 extension law. Apex has experienced numerous delays and setbacks due to COVID-19, putting at risk a huge investment and the best interests of Virginians. Given the numerous benefits offered by Rocky Forge, it is in everyone's best interest that you reconsider your position. Now let's step back and have a quick look at the big picture. We've known for decades now that greenhouse gas emissions are the principal cause of rapid climate change. The predictions of the vast majority of scientists have been accurate with one big exception. That is the increase in frequency and intensity of the destructive weather events. And sure enough, here we are facing a code red alert. We're running out of time. We, we have proven technologies available to address the climate crisis, the most productive being wind power. Yet, it is met by energetic opposition, a lot of it involving people who simply don't want to see it. Solar is the second big producer, and now it faces similar opposition. This is puzzling. Well, people are complicated, but one simple fact remains abundantly clear. We must transition away from fossil fuels as fast as possible, and Rocky Forge is our opportunity to serve mankind's best interest while earning the approval of a vast and growing number of people who know our future depends on projects like Rocky Ford Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Ludwig. My name is Michelle Ludwig. I'm in Rockbridge County, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak. I am in full support of Mr. Pearson's ruling, and I commend him for the diligence and accuracy of the research in arriving at his decision. I encourage you to take this opportunity to affirm that ruling. Apex's attorney made the false claim that the project is good for the area and the Commonwealth. It does not make economic sense without the commitment of the government using taxpayers' money to buy the power. By affirming the county zoning ruling, you were deserve the value and the natural beauty and habitat of this valley is famous for. This is not just my opinion. You see it when you walk into this building and stand in that hallway. There's a wall of windows that the architect incorporated into the plans to take full advantage of nature's scene that spreads in front of you. Please don't let Apex destroy it. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Hansen.
Thanks for having me. I'm Mark Hansen, um, 184 Vista Lane in Finn Castle. Um, I'm president of the Renewable Energy Volunteer Community Service Club. We install solar and wind on the weekends. Um, I guess the, the main point here is the General Assembly passed the state law for pandemic related delays, SB 5106, that applies to all projects in Virginia through 2022, including this one. The SWIN project will bring millions of dollars into the county and good paying jobs. And it's important to note that 38% uh, more jobs per kilowatt hour are generated with wind power than when they're equal. And that's from the American Academy of Sciences of six studies. So please support the Rocky Forge Wind Project. That's my two lots. Thanks. Thank you. Jerry Farley.
First off, I want to emphasize that this is not an abstract interpretation of state law. This is an application of a state law to a specific situation, which is before the zoning administrator, both because he was asked a specific question by an agreed party, and also because he was in the process of processing a site plan by the appellant. This was a very specific situation that was before him. It is his job as zoning administrator to administer the zoning ordinance, including how state law applies to specific situations under that ordinance. Secondly, um, I want to address very briefly the, uh, the issue of purpose of, of this statute. And uh, you've heard some testimony from Delegate Austin. You've also seen a letter from Senator Lewis. Uh, I want to emphasize that both Delegate Austin and Senator Lewis are people whom I admire very greatly. Um, I want to emphasize that they are men of integrity. Um, I have, of course, known Mr. Austin representing several localities in his district for many years. Um, Senator Lewis, I've lobbied him before. He's always been a friend of local governments as well. And therefore, been a friend of my clients and a friend of me. But I do want to say that there is, a, I do have a slight concern here, and I want to make sure and point it out. Um, that, uh, as Mr. Austin said, he's, he's been involved with wind energy, and particularly this project, for over a decade since he was on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Senator Lewis has been involved, he, he represents Accomack County, Northampton County, and parts of Virginia Beach. And he's been, in, uh, and that's the Eastern Shore, and y'all know where Virginia Beach is. Uh, he's been very deeply involved with offshore wind energy. And, and that's great. Wind energy, uh, offshore wind energy, all these things, it's forward thinking stuff. However, they may just be a little bit too close to this to give a dispassionate view of what the statute means. You might want to go ask the other 120 or so senators and delegates who voted for this statute what they thought that it means. It probably makes a little bit more sense for you to look at this in terms of the known facts that were out there in the world that were things that anybody who read the newspaper would be able to know, or anybody who was involved with the site processing site plans, processing SCPs, and doing the utility industry and heavy construction industries knew at the time, as well as the language of the statute, rather than kind of trying to do a little bit of Monday morning quarterbacking when you have the specific application in a specific situation in which individuals may have different pro or con investments. And like I said, I bet you that there's some members of the General Assembly who would come forward and be against this because they were also too close to it on a different side. Um, I did hear a little bit of, of, of people impugning the integrity of the zoning administrator, uh, as well as impugning the integrity of, uh, of APEX. Uh, APEX might not have been getting things done at, at, at a speed that we wish there may have been um, some issues there, there may have been program management uh, issues there. We don't doubt that they're good people. Um, we also don't doubt that they we're, 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 it's a complicated thing to say. We don't doubt that they're good people, okay? We also want, I also want to make sure that it's understood that our community development department, they are not respecters of persons. They do not make decisions based upon whether something is good or bad. Whether something's good or bad is a matter for the Board of Supervisors to decide. They just look at, the, look at what they've got and apply the rules to it. And I'll use a couple of different examples. Dr. Lank, I know Mr. Kidd, you remember that when it came through, but uh, Dr. Lank is a children's dentist down at, and she has her office down at the uh, Kroger Shopping Center that Steve Strauss owns. She fixes kids' crooked teeth, but in order to build a shed to store her children's toys and sets, she needed to get a proper amendment. It didn't matter that it was a particularly good and commendable project or that she was just the sweetest person you could ever meet. She still had to follow the rules, and we helped her through it, certainly. But she had to follow the rules. She needed to follow what the rules are that are applicable to everybody. 
the fact that uh, Apex draws, or Rocky Ford draws a lot of water, the fact that you're a $100 million company and she's a $100,000 dentist's office shouldn't make any difference in terms of how they're treated. And it doesn't. Drew Pearson has a huge retirement from North Carolina. He's a zoning administrator for many years, although you wouldn't know it to look at if you try, I bet you if Gary LaRue tried to tell him what he was going to decide, he'd go be a grandpa and give up being his own administrator. He's a man who's not a respecter of persons and does not take orders. He follows what he believes is the right thing to do based upon the language of what's put in front of him. And to that point, I also did want to point out that, uh, again, to this whole, is a deadline, is an expiration a deadline? Obviously, I've explained it. It's very odd to call an expiration a deadline. You wouldn't call it that in your ordinary life. But I also want to point out that we have had a couple of comments about potential extensions, including by Mr. Lofton. Rocky Ford has never asked the Board of Supervisors for an extension of the permit. We don't know what the answer to that would be. Just don't know. It's never been asked for. Um, wanted to address what I call the bucket theory of. Uh, there's special exception deadlines and special exception permits, and then local zoning ordinance that require a landowner are, are separate buckets. I did want to point out that this results, again, in deadlines and a special exception permit. For some reason, a pound of, for some reason, a gallon of water weighs 15 pounds on that side, but it only weighs seven and a half on the other side. The fact of the matter is that this is a far more inclusive and not parallel bucket. To, uh, between the two clauses. I want to point that final issue out. Um, I did want to, and, and for that matter, I did also want to make sure and highlight, I don't know who the gentleman was, I didn't catch his name, who was uh, the executive at a large engineering firm and, and told you what was actually going on in that industry last October. If I forget his name, I might call him as an expert witness at Circuit Court. Uh, but he, uh, uh, I would definitely highlight what he saw going on in industry at that time. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'll leave it at that with simply the point that it's not whether this is good or bad. Good or bad is a decision that the Board of Supervisors and the General Assembly make. The question is, and, and I could argue the point, I could argue that you know electricity is going to be generated, wind's better than burning dinosaurs. I could argue that this is going to ruin a mountaintop bridge and that 14 cent per kilowatt energy doesn't make sense when you can get solar and, and uh, salt fossil fuels for under 10 cents. I could argue both sides. I could argue any side of this. But what I'll tell you is this is about reading the application of particular situations to a particular piece of language in a particular SEP with a very particular statute that only applies to certain things in a little slice of the world. Pay attention to what the words say and how you read them as a common sense matter, rather than getting caught up too much in whether this is a good or bad project. Because at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter at this point. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. I, will, I appreciate each of you. Anything that I can answer? Thank, Thank you very you. much.
the, the legislation we put into place that becomes a code in the code of Virginia and the law by which the people of Virginia have to live by and act enacted and, and is affected on their lives, we take it very seriously. So, I, you know, I think everyone, all 140 of us, had an opportunity to place amendments on that legislation or to have an opinion on that legislation and to work. And I presented to you the votes on both the Senate side and the House side. And I contend that those individuals stand behind the legislation as presented. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Several things briefly in rebuttal. Um, one, I, I, to follow up on what Delegate Austin said, I think um, the board is welcome to contact Senator Lewis. He's giving you that invitation in his letter. I think he would welcome uh, questions. Uh, I think that the clear intent, the plain language of this statute, um, it is unambiguous, um, and there's only one result. And there are two buckets that the General Assembly gave where they were giving extensions. They're just blanket extensions. We didn't have to apply for it. We didn't have to ask for it. They, it occurred by operation of law, by operation of the General Assembly. Um, and the, the special exception permit that was approved in May clearly falls under what the General Assembly intended in subsection B. We would ask you um, respectfully to reverse the decision of Mr. Pearson um, you know, we, we recognize uh, the role of a zoning administrator. Uh, the, the code is very clear, um, however, that he's not infallible. Um, and people do make mistakes. And here, the General Assembly was very clear um, in, in the, the breadth and the scope of the extension that it was giving to all different types of zoning issues, such as the special exception permit that is now in front of you. Um, <coughs> So what we would ask you to do um, is reverse the decision of the zoning administrator, um, hold that 22, uh, I'll just call it 2209B, uh, applies to condition 18, hold that the special exception permit is still valid, and that Rocky Forge has until at least July 1st, 2022, um, to obtain site plan uh, approval. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Gentlemen, we've heard the arguments. We've heard from I feel like we need to go into closed session for our attorney. Um, so we go ahead. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we go into closed session for the purpose of co consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to section 2.23711A8, the Code of Virginia, 1950, as amended in regard to an appeal of zoning administrator's determination on the validity of special exception permit authorizing a utility wind energy system. Got a second. Second. Got a motion for the second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Um, I guess we kind of need to set a time and we're getting into the lunch hour too.
Some people that have um, not, um, not necessarily have these things on their mind, but they can tell them and talk about um, private private psychedelics or you know some medium or whatever it is. Um, I'm not sure that I've done any of that stuff, but it's something to think about. I can't do anything about it myself. I'm just saying. I'm a philosopher. presumptuous to put myself in that category, but I think I'm pretty presumptuous as far as I know. Yeah. The problem is my people are usually the ones that end up sick and broken all the time.
Do I hear a motion for us to return to closed session? A motion to return to open session. To be it resolved, it is certified that to the best of each Board of Zoning Appeals member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempt from opening meeting requirements and only such matters as were identified in the motions to go to the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered during the closed session. Do I hear a second? Second. Got a motion to second. All those in favor say yes. 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 All right. And just roll call. You want roll call? Yes, please. Yeah. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Kidd? Yes. Mr. Caldwell? Yes. Mr. Cash? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I think at this time we are good. Heard the evidence and testimony and, and we're ready to, to make our, our decision on, on this. Um, do I hear a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to overturn the zoning administrator's decision that the May 26, 2020 special exception permit issued to Rocky Ford Wind LLC and Jerry L. Fraley, trustee, expired on May 26, 2021, based on arguments and testimony presented today and the following findings and conclusions. Virginia Code Section 15.2-2209.1, was intended to extend the deadline of the project covered by the special exception permit until July 1st, 2022, or such longer period as may be agreed to by the locality. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? A second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, would you like to roll call? Yes, please. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Kidd? Yes. Mr. Caldwell? Yes. Mr. Cash? Yes. 